All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session, um, Forced Migration in Africa, the Case of Liberian Refugees in Ghana. In this session, we'll be hearing from the authors of two books, The Myth of Self-Reliance, Economic Lives Inside a Liberian Refugee Camp, and that's by Nehiko Omata, and Deadly Voyages, Migrant Journeys Across the Globe by Veronica Finn Brewey. And I'm just going to say a quick land acknowledgement for Athabasca University. We're on the border of Treaty 6 and 8, and we recognize and acknowledge this is the traditional and ancestral land, home to many First Nation, Métis, and Inuit, and is the traditional homeland to Cree, Dene, and Métis, including our neighbors from Alexander Cree Nation, Alexis Nakota Sioux Nation, Enoch Cree Nation, Paul First Nation, Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, Fort Chippewan Métis, and Mikitsu Cree First Nation. And we'll go ahead um, and start with some introductions. So first we have Professor Neahiko Omata. He teaches and researches in the Refugee Center at the University of Oxford. Prior to joining this, Neahiko was Senior Teaching Fellow in the Development Studies at the, universe, at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Previously, he has worked as a practitioner and consultant for UNDP, UNHCR, and international and local NGOs in various sub-Saharan African countries. Based on extensive research in West Africa, Mayahiko has published widely on refugee livelihoods, rights, and repatriation, including articles in the Journal of Refugee Studies and Forced Migration Review. Before starting his career in forced migration and international development, he worked in the private sector in Japan and the United States. Neahiko received his PhD in Development Studies at SOAS, University of London. He also holds an MA in Forced Migration and Humanitarian Aid from the Fletcher School of Tufts University and a BA in Law from the University of Tokyo. And we also have Dr. Veronica Finn Brewey, who teaches and researches in the Legal Studies Department at Athabasca University. She is a multi-award winner and a passionate academic advocate. Holding six academic degrees from four continents, she has researched, taught, consulted, and presented at conferences in over 30 countries. She's authored five books, several book chapters, and journal articles. She is the founder and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Internal Displacement, the co-lead of Law and Society's Collaborative Research Network, Displaced Peoples, the lead of Law and Society Association's International Research Collaborative, Disrupting Patriarchy and Masculinity in Africa, the founder of the Voice of West African Refugees in, in Ghana at the Budaburam Refugee Center Settlement in Ghana. She also has she has the Australian National University International Alumna of the Year for 2021, the president of the International Association for the Study of Forced Migration, and a co-chair in the Africa Interest Group and the American Society of International Law. Currently, she is an Action Canada Fellow 2022 to 2023, Director of Flowers School of Global Health Sciences and Assistant Professor of Legal Studies at Athabasca University. Veronica is a born and bred Indigenous Liberian war survivor. So we're going to start off our talk with Neahiko. Hi. Okay, thank you very much, Joanna. Um, and um, can you hear me okay right now? Is this uh, loud enough, loud and clear? Great, thank you. Uh, let me share this screen. Um, Right now, is this showing? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and also, um, very nice to meet you all uh, through this online. Um, as Joanna explained, my name is Naohiko Mata, and uh, I'm doing this presentation from uh, Oxford today. And uh, I really want to say, first of all, um, thank you to Veronica and also Joanna and uh, for organizing this event because uh, we discuss a lot of uh, good ideas, but not all good ideas actually being uh, implemented. So I really appreciate 
um, your effort to make this kind of things happen. And uh, thank you very much. So, um, <clears throat> as Joanna introduced, uh, I'm currently working at the Refugee Study Center at the University of Oxford. And uh, before moving to the presentation, um, I just say a few words, my, you know, kind of uh, engagement with uh, Veronica. And uh, actually, myself and Veronica, um, strangely, we never met uh, in person so far. Um, she wrote the book review uh, of my you know, book, which I'm uh, presenting today, some years back. And since then, we began our kind of communications, uh, primarily through emails and also Skype calls. And we have been always seeking um, collaborative work together. And we plan to do some conferences, um, but unfortunately, during the COVID, um, many of these conferences, which we plan to do uh, presentation together, were cancelled. So today, I'm really delighted to have this uh, opportunity and to do this joint book talk with Veronica. So thank you very much once again. Um, let me move on. So, um, okay, so today I'm discussing about the book I published, and uh, as the title indicates, um, especially subtitle indicates, this book is about the economic lives of Liberian refugees uh, inside a Buduburam refugee camp. And uh, this is uh, the place Veronica knows much better than I do. And uh, I, I mean, this book initially came out in 2017 as a hard cover, and they became a paperback in 2000, I think, 20 or 21. And it was a midst of COVID, so we didn't do any in-person uh, book events at that point. So what is really this book about? Um, it's about you know refugees' economic strategies in the face of all the challenges they face on the ground, and uh, this Budibram refugee camp. Um, I before I started my PhD, I worked here as a kind of volunteer uh, for the NGO assisting uh, um, like a former child soldiers from Liberia, and I worked there between 2005 and. Uh, five, six, and seven. Um, almost every weekend I visited there and I became very familiar with the people living in this camp. And uh, I did my PhD from 2008 and up until 2012. And I conducted my field work inside uh, this Budiburam refugee camp. Um, that was very much uh, ethnographic field work so I resided inside a refugee camp for about uh, 13 months, and I was uh, kind of homestaying at the you know like families of uh, Liberian refugees there. And uh, the book is the central argument in this book is that to challenge or question the self-reliant status of refugees living inside the camp. Um, Self-reliance is the term that the UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, often uses. It is a kind of a state that refugees are able to meet their basic needs without really relying on humanitarian agencies such as UNHCR. And uh, this camp has been kind of commended by UNHCR as a kind of self-reliant camp and a kind of exemplary model. However, when I was doing volunteer work, I was kind of suspecting about this self-reliant status because uh, I met a lot of refugees who were very much struggling to survive in this camp uh, with very little support from the aid agency. So I wanted to challenge this idea by doing, uh, MP, um, by collecting empirical data by myself. Okay. That's a kind of drive of this book. So today's presentation, yes, of course, I'll speak about the book um, I published, but before that, um, I give a kind of a 
uh, overview of the you know, global refugee context for recent years, especially because I presume today not all participants are so good enough forced migration experts. So I'll start with that one. And uh, section two and th three, I'll be presenting key findings from the book. Uh, second section, especially about economic lives of refugees. And uh, here I'm highlighting the kind of inequality within the refugee camp between refugees. And the third section, I discuss about this uh, resettlement dream to the global north which is also closely related to this kind of economic inequality inside this camp. And I'll just conclude my presentation really to tell you what happened to these Liberian refugees in this Budibram camp. How was the end of my field work? And in total, I aim to speak about the next 15 minutes or so. Okay. Okay. So um, <clears throat> let me start with a kind of a general kind of statistics here. Um, you know, refugees are people, as probably you know, who fled the, their own country because of the persecution, violence, and the conflicts. And the, the number of refugees globally has been increasing, especially over the last uh, 10 years or so, as you see it in this graph. Okay. But the issue with the current forced migration is not just simply the number is increasing. At the same time, the period refugees spend in exile is getting longer and longer. Okay. In theory, being a refugee should be a kind of a temporary phenomenon. And the refugee camps are typically considered kind of temporary spaces just to host you know, these refugees as a guest until they go back to their home. However, in reality, we are facing so-called uh, protracted refugee situations. According to UNHCR, um, refugee situations which went beyond five years um, are generally called you know, protracted refugee situations, often abbreviated as a PRS. And uh, Currently, the majority of refugees worldwide are considered living in protracted, protracted refugee situations. And uh, according to UNHCR, the average length of their exile is being you know, like 26 years. And uh, there are a lot of uh, negative um, symptoms related to these protracted refugee situations. First of all, you know, when the refugee situation becomes longer, the interest of donor community will usually decrease uh, significantly, okay? Because they tend to look into more like a imminent, urgent cases globally. And uh, this uh, decreasing interest usually results in kind of diminishing of humanitarian aid for protracted refugees. And the Budibram refugee camp, which I conducted my study, is a very typical example of this protracted refugee situations. Okay. So where this camp is located, um, this is a quite a big map, including West Africa. And uh, you see to the very um, bottom of towards the right, and this kind of red circle, um, that's where this camp, Budibram refugee camp, is located, or like was located. As you see it, this camp has been hosting um, Liberian refugees. But as you can see in this uh, map, Ghana and Liberia um, do not have the border um, between. There is a Cote d'Ivoire, so a lot of Liberian refugees fled their country and they passed through Cote d'Ivoire and then arrived in Ghana and settled in this Budibram refugee camp. Let me say a few more words about the kind of features of this Budibram camp. The camp was founded in 1990 
in order to accommodate, you know, like Liberian refugees who left their countries because of the like a civil war, which continued in total over like 20, uh, sorry, 14 years um, up until 2003. So this is a very typical like protracted refugee situation. And uh, this, oh, let me just show you some slides here. Um, these are kind of houses inside the refugee camp. As you see here, um, because it's a long standing camp, so you don't necessarily see, you know, kind of makeshift tents anymore. Rather, many of the houses are in the kind of permanent structure made of, of the concrete. Okay. okay, let me go back to this one. And the, this camp was located in one of the poorest districts in Ghana. And the, when I started my field work, now, which goes back, you know, almost like 15 years ago, the camp population was about 20,000 as of 2008. And uh, this camp has been receiving very limited assistance from donor community. As I mentioned earlier, this is protracted refugee situations, so donor interest was dwindling very sharply. And uh, as I already explained, but this camp was uh, commended by UNHCR as a kind of self-reliant camp. Despite the decreasing amount of humanitarian aid, UNHCR uh, described a lot of refugees inside of this camp as uh, self-reliant. They are making their own way through without relying on UNHCR. Okay. So, how did the refugees make ends meet, you know, with very little access to international aid? Um, there are a variety of refugee businesses inside a camp. I put some photos um, of these businesses here. And that at the glance, yes, seemingly there is a kind of thriving economy because of the you know, many uh, businesses operated by refugees inside the camp. And the UNHCR considered this is a kind of sign of, you know, their economic prosperity and also self-reliance uh, in this camp. However, during my research, I, I interviewed a lot of uh, refugee business owners and they were lamenting the business is, is not really producing any profit for them um, because the number of customers are rather small and there are many customers also refugees living in the camp uh, who have very limited purchasing power. And these owners were echoing that business you know, does not make, make you rich in this camp. In order to become uh, wealthy, you have to have someone abroad who can help you. Okay. And they were all referring to remittances. Because the importance of remittances was echoed by many refugees, so I wanted to assess the kind of magnitude of remittances uh, coming into this camp. And the uh, I'm sure you know Veronica um, remembers, but in front of this refugee camp, there were two Western Union branches where most refugees were receiving remittances from abroad. Okay. So I went there, their branches and I negotiated to get some statistics and I just combined the figures from two branches in this table. Um, this is a monthly average remittances and uh, most of remittances are coming from you know, like refugees' relatives uh, living in U.S., Canada, Australia. And uh, 2009, it's a little um, decreasing because uh, that year, a um, good number of refugees decided to go back to Liberia. But between 2006 and uh, 8, you know, crudely, every month, about 800,000 USD is coming into this uh, refugee camp on average. 
if I divide this figure, let's say 800,000, by the number of refugees at that point, which is 20,000 20, residents, it's crudely about 40 USD per month. And that's not a negligible amount in this camp setting. Okay. And also during my research, I collected a um, significant amount of quantitative data. Okay. Especially about household economies, including their income level and also income sources. And this table is a kind of a summary of that. And I classified um, refugee household into four categories, uh, depending on the level of income they receive, you know, from high income and the middle income, low income, and the very low income. And as you can see in this table, um, high income household, they are hugely reliant on remittances. And uh, <clears throat> ironically, lower the economic, I mean, lower the income status, the more dependent on, you know, business or like employment, casual labor. Okay. And what was most striking to me was the kind of inequality within this camp because they are all Liberian refugees. And, uh, but between refugees, there was a significant economic differences. And this difference is largely made by access to the remittances. So in the camp, these kind of high income household, especially, and to some degree, middle income household, they are doing uh, relatively okay and uh, they are able to meet their basic needs primarily through uh, remittances. So in a way, they are considered kind of self-reliant. But if we look into the lives of low-income or like a very low-income household, um, their life was in impoverishment, and the, many of them are suffering uh, to secure their basic needs. Um, with a very small amount of the income they make. And uh, their economic situation was far from being considered a self-reliant. So this um, acute poverty, especially in low income and very low income, um, led to the kind of perception that uh, you know, if they move to global north, or like developing countries, sorry, developed countries, sorry, um, everything will become uh, rosy and uh, it will become a kind of a game changer for their life. And this leads to the so-called like resettlement desire dream to the global north um, in this camp, especially those uh, with a poor economic status. And uh, in order to end their refugee lives, uh, UNHCR has set up like a so-called like three durable solutions. Okay, and one durable solution is repatriation to their home country, meaning that they go back. In this case, they go back to Liberia and to restore their lives and the citizenship. And the UNHCR organized, you know, several rounds of repatriation program for Liberian refugees and they one point almost like pressurizing them to go back but many refugees did not uh, did not join these repatriation programs and the second durable solution is called uh, local integration in this case um, to be integrated and uh, in Ghana and eventually obtaining you know, permanent residency or even citizenship. But uh, Liberian refugees showed very little interest in being integrated in Ghana. So instead, as I mentioned, they pursued this third country resettlement in the global north. And especially because of the kind of historical bond uh, they dreamed of being resettled in the United States. And uh, in a way, because of this dream, many of them 
didn't take repatriation or they showed no interest in integration, but they decided to remain in Ghana in order to seek this resettlement opportunities. However, um, in 2012, their refugee lives kind of officially ended because UNHCR called the so-called so cessation clause of their refugee status. What it means is that UNHCR assessed the situation in Liberia and the Liberian civil war ended in 2003. So Liberia is already safe enough to go back for refugees. So they basically stopped their refugee status. However, at the end of June 2012, I mean, that's the time officially this cessation clause was invoked for these Liberians. Still about 5,000 or even more Liberian ex-refugees decided to remain in Ghana, okay? And they didn't return to Liberia even at the point. So this is kind of my final slide and uh, also my conclusion as well. Um, my book ends, you know, when refugee status is coming to the end in 2012. And uh, I concluded by addressing my concerns about these like, remaining librarians in Ghana, almost like a forgotten refugees, because their status is very, very ambiguous. They are, officially speaking, no longer refugees, you know, after the cessation clause was invoked. But at the same time, certainly they are not the Ghanaian citizens. But just they are remaining in Ghana with a very ambiguous uh, migration status there. So I was always wondering, did their, did their refugee life really end when cessation clause came in? And even after my field work um, and I came to Oxford, I have remained in touch with the um, certain number of refugee participants in my study. Still, I'm in communication with the 20 or 30 of them um, quite regularly. So I feel like my project with these Liberian refugee people is still not really ending. So this year, I'm planning to go back to this Budiburam camp, um, hopefully in June. And uh, my primary purpose is to, you know, kind of disseminate my research work, especially books with uh, these participants. But at the same time, I would like to know more about their so-called post-refugee lives and how they have been managing their lives even after their cessation close. So this is the end of my presentation, and uh, thank you very much for listening today. Thanks so much for that. Um, I'll start uploading your slides right now, Veronica, and um, then we can you can talk now. Thank you, Joanna. Can I do the reflection for Neo first before I do my presentation? Yes, yeah, so I have about five, ten minutes, just a quick one. Um, so first, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to everybody. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, I really like to say thank you to everybody for showing up. Uh, it means a lot to me. I really appreciate it for what Joanna has invested in our work. Um, I had Actually, Neo, so a little bit of background as well. Neo had sent me a couple of his books and I uh, and asked me if I would be willing to uh, share it around uh, libraries in Canada. And I said, oh, yeah, this is great because uh, I'm on a personal mission to make Canadians educated about Liberians. They don't know anything about Liberians, so this is perfect. 
So uh, I sent one of Neo's book to UBC, my uh, alma mater as well. And then I sent one to University of Alberta, and then I sent one to Athabasca University. And when Joanna received it, I she let me know that she got it, and I was really pleased. And I said, can we do a book talk, you know, so people can know what the book is about in the library, and Joanna agreed to do it. Uh, so we are very pleased and we are very honored to, that you took the time to, you know, develop and design and all. I mean, it's been months and months of planning. So we are grateful. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I also just really want to say uh, thank you to everyone for, you know, signing up and coming to listen to us. We wish we would have more time to talk because the issue is so complicated and it's so fascinating. In fact, I didn't want you to stop speaking, uh, but uh, we, we don't have the time. So I would just quickly give a, a, a brief uh, reflection of some of the things that Neil highlighted. So like Neil said, um, I, I didn't know of him and, you know, in reality, Liberians, we are a very small country. Our population was less than 2.5 million before the war in 1990, and now we are about 4 million people. And Liberians are not like Nigeria, it's not powerhouse Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa on a continent. We are very low key and not many people know about Liberians. So there are a few Liberianists out there, uh, actually people that are researching and doing work on Liberia. So um, of course, when I heard of Neil's book, because I subscribed to Brangham book, and they will usually tell me what the migration books that are out. And I saw Neil's book was on, I was like, wow, he's Japanese. How can this Japanese be interested in Liberia? This is impossible. This is never, I mean, there's no like Japanese uh, uh, Liberianist. It's, I mean, I can't believe this. I need to read this book. And then, of course, I'm suspicious. I'm like, what does he want from Liberia? I'm sure he's going to extract something out of this country, blah, 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 blah. You know, all my internal eternals going out. And I'm just like, oh, my God, foreigners coming to Liberia and taking control and wanting to take over our knowledge and whatever. And so I, I, I asked Bergen Books to give me a review copy, and I read the book. And I did his book, uh, uh a re book review, and I was so moved, I was so touched at how passionately he wrote about Liberia and how he was engaged and involved, and it was so meaningful and respectful. So then I contacted him, and that's how we started our relationship. And our conference didn't come up, but hopefully we we'll get to see each other in Kenya with uh, the next ISFM, hopefully. Um, but uh, Neil has been a really strong inspiration, and I think he's the only Japanese Liberianist that I know. And so I just really want to say thank you, Neil, uh, for being the one and only Japanese interested in Liberia <laughs> a scholarship. <laughs> Most of your work is just uh, is reminiscence of my experience. It's very accurate. And even the reviews that were written, written by, you know, uh, Aliena and Jeff Crisp and Alex Betts and all those folks from uh, our networks. Uh, it was very, very, very uh, reflective of my reality. There are just a few things I'll highlight and then I'll go on to my uh, presentation. So like Neo mentioned, Liberia is not bordering with Ghana. And one of the contexts and the reason why Liberians went to Ghana is because Liberia is a U.S. colony. Liberians never like to think that they are colonized, but we were colonized by the U.S. I re-emphasize and, and reassert. <laughs> so um, being English-speaking speaking country, when the war, of course, we, you never have control when there is war, whether where to go and where not to go. But doing that, period of evacuation, many people were forced to go to Cote d'Ivoire and Guinea, which are two bordering countries. But some of us who had the opportunity to survive three years of the war before we were evacuated, we had an opportunity to think whether we wanted to go to French-speaking country, where we'll have trouble going to school, continuing our education, considering that we had lost already three years of the war. So you notice that 
immediately the war uh, Cote d'Ivoire and Guinea took and Sierra Leone took a lot of Liberian refugees. But then as time went on, Nigeria and Ghana hosted the, the maximum amount of Liberians because they are both British colonies and they speak English. So that was part of the reason we also were evacuated by the Ghanaian peacekeeping force to Ghana. Sierra Leone at the time I left was also in war, so we couldn't go to Sierra Leone. And of course, like I said, Ghana and uh, Cote d'Ivoire and Guinea weren't an option for us. In fact, they were farther away from Morovia where I grew up. So we made our way on the deck of the peacekeeping vessel and that's how we went to Ghana. Um, over the years, I think Ghana was able to host up to 160,000 Liberian refugees. And uh, during the war, about 250,000 people died and at least 800,000 to a million were displaced. So um, you can, and people just kept on fluctuating back and forth looking for opportunity. And of course, when the resettlement program came in, a lot of Liberians also moved to the U.S. because of our, they are our colonial masters. So a lot of Liberians actually live in the U.S. With UNSCR Durable sol Solution, and this is one of the reasons I really uh, appreciate and, and respect Neil's work, is the way he was very critical of UNSCR. I mean, working with an NGO and being critical of UNSCR is not very easy, but um, I'm so pleased that he has such a great academic work and didn't necessarily got uh, disillusioned by the fact that he was working with uh, UN uh, organizations, but he was a consultant with UNHCR and, and worked doing work for them when he did this critical uh, uh, reflection of UNHCR. So that's one thing I'm very grateful to him for, for questioning the whole self-reliance and UNHCR so-called durable solution. As refugees, we never call it durable solution. It is not a durable solution. And the first aspect of uh, voluntary repatriation is never voluntary. UNHCR forced Liberians to go back to Liberia, claiming that the war was over and invoking the secession clause prematurely because, yes, the war was over in 2003. I mean, people still dealing with what happened in Nazi Germany in 1945 how is it that after seven years or nine years, you think Liberia is so well ready now for people to go back home? A lot of kids were born, like, as, as Neil said, it's a dis, uh, protracted situation. So a lot of children were born in, uh, uh, in a protracted, in a refugee camp. They know nothing but Ghana as their home. Um, and so just to not put a sustainable plan together, you know, doing 2012 hours back, I went back to Liberia to assess the situation myself. And I re I remember there was no public grade electricity in Liberia. There's still no public grade electricity in Liberia. There was no uh, portable water coming from the tap. When I was a child, I always drank well water and we still, people still drinking well water and not from the tap. And 60% uh, of our population is not educated. Like, there is just bad situation. Yes, Ellie Johnson Sally was elected in 2005, and she did an amazing work. But imagine the humongous amount of work that she had to do over her 12-year period to try to just bring Liberia to some level of peace. And then now you're saying all these people, over 20, uh, 120,000 people should go back out of out of the blue and most of them had no connections there's a serious land ownership issue in the country people lost their lands people's house were dish i mean like i can't even go into detail so that whole thing was a facade and most people actually took uh the so-called hundred dollars i think it came to hundred dollars now right now and then they came back right back they just got back on the bus and came back to the to ghana to stay even though they were repatriated so UNACR has a number of yeah we repatriated about 100,000 people but half of them actually just returned and came back to Ghana. Um, my last point I would like to highlight is that I've put a little uh, um, a, a link in the chat based on 
what Nay was saying, you know, after many years, he wants to go back and see what is happening. Situation has changed to some extent because I was in like I was in uh, Ghana and on a refugee camp between 2018 to 2020. But what has happened, and bless Ellen Johnson Salif uh, for doing that, Liberians are issued passports, and now their status is somehow regularized. But this chapter that Heaven Crowley and I wrote is literally saying Liberians are hanging in the air in Ghana because, yes, some of them with Ellen Johnson Salif negotiating with the Ghana government and UNHCR, Passports were finally issued to Liberians, but in their passport, they is stamped not eligible to work in Ghana. So that's just one of the most difficult experiences of Liberians. And as Neo said, without remittances, Liberians will never, ever survive in Ghana. And think about this for some of us who never had anybody in the U.S. My mom didn't have, didn't have any family in the U.S., so we were among those low-class, low-key people that were living in Area U in a tent and not having anything. I mean, Area U stinks. It smells. The open pit was horrible. You know the smell in Area U then, near you were there. And um, my mom didn't get any uh, remittances from the U.S. regularly, so we didn't have anything, and that was why in 20, uh, 2000, and, and we, I arrived in Ghana in, 2000, in 1992. In 1994, my mom said, I can't bear this anymore. After two years, she just decided I'm going back to Liberia to die than to live in this refugee camp, so that's how I ended up staying in Ghana by myself because my mom couldn't live in Ghana anymore, and she went back. So without taking too much of the time, because I just really want to brush over my book, I will end my reflection here. It's just so much to say. This is, I live and breathe this life, so it's not, you know, just what Nadia has written. I actually live the experiences he's written about, which is uh, very dear to my heart, uh, and I don't want to take any more time talking more about it. Hopefully, some of the questions and and discussions or suggestions you have will bring some of, some more of the issues out when we have the Q&A time. But uh, Joanna, please give me uh, at least 10 minutes that mean to my presentation. Let me just go very quickly. Okay, so um, in 2000, this book was published in 2020. In 2018, I had gone for a Law and Society conference and I presented a paper on this exact topic. I actually wrote a little bit of my this deadly voyages in a, 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 a an edited book in 2018 uh, the same year and I, I i developed it into a presentation and i did it at um law and society conference and then in 2019 i got an email from lexington asking me to turn the presentation into a book and i was really really shocked that was the first time an editor has a book acquisition editor has contacted me that my topic is so important that they want me to turn into a book. So I was freaking out. I was like, oh, my God, what am I supposed to do? Um, at the time, I was living in the U.S. I had just finished my Ph.D. and finished my uh, time at the University of Washington. And so I was, I was uh, teaching at uh, Seattle University School of Law as an adjunct professor. And so I went to Professor Bender. So this book is co-author, me and Professor Bender. So I went to Professor Bender, who is my mentor, and I adore him. He's somebody who has invested in my life. He's interested in my development and my growth. And he's literally taken me by the hand, and I, I would not leave his hand uh, until he's retired. But Professor ben, I went to Professor Bender, and I said, look, I'm not able to do this by myself. Can you help me? learn this process of doing an edited book. And so Professor Bender said, okay, you will be the first author. That was the thing, he, the first thing he said, because you are the one, this is your work. Uh, but he's also involved in uh, North American and, and he's, he's um, Latin, Latino American. And so he does most migration work from South America and Mexico to the US. So he said, let's do it. 
So that's how me and Professor Bender work on this book project. And I, I mean, he's not able to be present today, but I just wanted to highlight my relationship with him. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm just going to go give you really a brisk, rushed version of what the book is because I honestly just want to leave time for a question and answer or interactions with those of you that are part of this uh, interesting talk, book talk. So I'm going to brush over it and we encourage you to buy our books. This is the most important thing. We want you to learn about Liberia. We want you to know about Liberia's, Liberia's experiences. And so please, um, I, I, I urge you to go and buy the book. Next slide, please, Joanna. This is Professor Bender, and I've already said a lot about him, and I just really want to uh, say again that I appreciate him. He means the world to me. He is, uh, he and I are co-chairs of the Displaced Peoples Network, what uh, Joanna mentioned when she was reading my bio, and we do a lot of work at Law and Society, so we'll be meeting in San Juan in Puerto Rico in uh, June this year, so I'm looking forward to seeing him. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Yes. Um, so the background for this book, and uh, one of the things personally that I'm kind of always very upset about this whole UN system is the fact that, yes, um, 1951, when the convention was being developed, it was very, very Eurocentric. It is still Eurocentric, even though the 1967 protocol tried to remove the Eurocentricity of Nazi Germany war against Jewish, Jewish people by extending the refugee convention beyond Europe, what was happening in Europe to the rest of the world, and by removing the time period from 1939 to 45, so the temporality of the 1951 convention was, you know, done away with in the 1967 protocol. But at the same time, this convention never, ever mentioned one of the, in fact, not one, the largest dehumanized uh, forced migration of, of human beings, which was the transatlantic slave trade. So with this book, it was an opportunity for me to also delve into uh, the reality of my, my, uh, forced migration, not just of uh, what is happening in contemporary times, because yes, what is happening now is a result of all the horrible colonizations across the world uh, 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 and the transatlantic slave trade and the Berlin Conference in 1881 that destroyed Africa. All these things have their pretext and their stamps in these historical trajectories that the UNHCR convention never want to talk about, don't even include it, don't even include the fact that indigenous peoples are also forcibly uh, uh, migrated because of colonization, never recognize any of that stuff in the, in the United Nations 1951 convention. So personally, I really think that convention is a kick. It's old. It should be done away with. But the truth is, a lot of people live off of the suffering of a lot of poor people. So the power there be would never, and I mean, Neo knows this, a lot of gurus on refugee law know this, that the Refugee Convention is not applicable to our current situation. And now with climate change and LGBT rights and women going through sexual violence or other forms of violence that are denied, that are persecuted because of that, but deny refugee status because this limited refugee convention does not recognize all those things. Um, we know that it needs a serious reform. Another aspect of the context of the book is both people. Of course, I lived in Australia. I went to school in Australia and was just constantly overcome by people that were called both people jumping in queues. In Canada, we've had our our, our experience here with the uh, uh, Nepalese, and and that came, uh, I think it was in the 80s, but that was the most major one, and I think some Haitians that were also caught on international waters coming to Canada, but we haven't had the kind of experiences that is going on in uh, Europe and uh, uh, South, sorry, and uh, Australia. 
of course, the Northern Triangle in um, um, North America from Guatemala, Colombia, and coming down to uh, other countries in South South America and coming down to Mex coming up to Mexico, the amounts of uh, so-called caravan, uh, Donald Trump will call it a caravan is coming. Um, these are serious, unprecedented migration situations that are happening that we really need to revisit the 1951 convention on how to relate to this uh, complex form of migration. Next slide, please. There's the book. Um, please get a copy. That's all I was here for now on this slide. Next slide, please. I dedicated, or we dedicated this book to migrants everywhere in need of compassion, dignity, and respect, whose persistence, resilience, and dare to survive predispose them to incomprehensible perils. We honor the lives of those that have been lost during the deadly voyages. And I forgot to say, I mean, um, most recently, what actually inspired the book for me, apart from the transatlantic slave trade, what's happening in the Northern Triangle and what is happening in Australia was also the fact that a lot of Africans from uh, East and the Southern portion are being forcibly migrated across the Mediterranean Sea to Europe and end up losing their lives on the water. So um, when I when we dedicated a book to those lost lives, we're definitely thinking about many who were lost at sea or who are still lost at sea trying to traverse uh, from Northern Africa to, to European shores, especially Italy, Greece, and, and parts of Turkey. Next slide, please. Next slide. This is just... Uh, so I just want to give you a good uh, overview of the contents of the book, and then I will highlight a little bit of my chapter I wrote, and then I'll close my presentation. Um, we had chapter one was from Angel, who wrote about learning to look Mexican, Central American minor migrants, and their strategies to min minimize the risk of migration. Um, Nicholas and Francesca looked at responding to the back wave, the migrant crisis, and the Gambia. And I could go into details about this, but honestly, I really don't want to spend too much more time talking about individual chapters. Um, chapter three was voyaging into the unknown as migrants and trafficked. In the trafficked, women and girls traffic tra traveling from Kenya to Al Shabaab waterfront in. Somalia, if you don't know about Al-Shabaab, is literally, literally a, a subunit of ISIS and, and uh, the Islamic State in parts of Somalia, Kenya, and I think Uganda, but don't quote me on that. Next slide, please. The next uh, part of the book looked at uh, refugee narratives and Maya um, wrote about refugee status for survivor of dangerous journeys, establishing a nexus to nationality. Naya is from uh, uh, Germany, so she focused on the EU with this chapter. Uh, refugee narratives and lived experiences, deconstructing, deconstructing negative attitudes within the European public sphere was written by Mohammed, who was who is now at University of Ottawa, but he collected his data in England, and so he was able to get some really good uh, uh, narrative and sentiments about um, uh, hatred for migration or xenophobia for migrants in Europe, which is not much different from some of the uh, sentiments we get in Canada. Kate is a sister and a friend. Kate and I went to uh, ANU. She's currently teaching at ANU. She wrote about Destination Australia, Journey of the Moribund. And so Kate was literally focusing on the most devastating experiences of refugees in Australia, which is not really known. People like to talk about Donald Trump, but I always tell people that before Donald Trump came to power, there was Australia. Australia has a horrible 
refugee and migration policy and have resulted in detrimental and deadly experiences of migrants and literally have externalized their border to Papua New Guinea and Nauru and just leave people to die and waste their way over there. UNHCR has called them out on several times. Human rights institutions like the UNHCR, uh, UN High Commission for Human Rights have called them out on human rights abuses of refugees. Australia has done nothing about it. Those are some of the things Kate is talking about in her chapter. Next part, please. Uh, life and death, voyages after death, identifying bodies from the Mediterranean. Irenia was doing her PhD at the time. She's Italian. Of course, she visited uh, all the horrible deaths and scenes on the shores of Italy, and her PhD work is focused on that. So she published that chapter. And Professor Bender actually talked about deadly deportations, and Canada is notorious for doing that, sending back people that are rejected and not fit within the five nexus of UNHCR convention. And so people are deported, deported literally to their death, and especially in the U.S. So he was talking about um, mostly Latinos and people from Latin America and South America and Mexico who are deported uh, and not seen as bona fide legal refugees and so then they go back to their deaths. Next part please. Climate change, of course this is a big one uh, and still button. Nobody wants to develop a refugee convention to now consider all the issues that are happening that are resulting in environmental displacement. Uh, but Nergis, uh, I know Nergis uh, very well. We, She's a professor at Osgood where I did my master's in law and Nergis wrote on climate-related displacement, she and Azin, on climate-related displacement in the age of the Anthropocene. Uh, Chen Liu is from uh, China and now lives in BC, uh, did PhD at uh, uh, Georgetown Law and focused on displacement, disaster displacement, humanitarian development context. And Michael, Michael is from Ghana, from northern part of Ghana. He's one of my really good colleagues. And Michael did a chapter on managing cross-border climate-induced migration in, Afri in the African Union, legal implications and policies, policy interventions. So he focused on uh, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, and uh, the AU, the African Union as well. Next slide, please. Yes, so I put my chapter in the end uh, because I believe in promoting people's work um, and I wanted the law and policy hopefully to be the, the message that people will leave with. So me and Tereni took this portion of, of the book and Tereni wrote on environmental refugees for Bangladesh and I focused on the African Union and the disappointing, sluggish and just unacceptable attitude. African Union have always relied on Western money, funds to be able to sustain itself. And that conditionality always limit them from just doing something more meaningful. So they will engage with the EU, but the EU will do some really diabolical and horrible conditions of exchange. And for example, EU give uh, the African Union money, and then the, the chairman was um, the commissioner, the head committee chair of the, the African Union Commission was from Nigeria, the Nigerian president, and literally saying, don't let them come to Europe. So take this money and do everything you can to stop them and let them stay in uh, uh, Africa, in West Africa specifically. So they had this same uh, policy exchange with Mali because most of the people that are leaving uh, on the deadly voyages across the Mediterranean are coming from parts of Sudan and Nigeria and Ghana and Mali, Burkina Faso, Cameroon. And so they're trying, EU, the European Union, is trying to do everything they can through the AU to just put a stop to it. Never had the AU held European countries responsible for dehumanizing and destabilizing the continent. Okay, when you were taking us and selling us as slaves to, to become part of your e economic situation, you didn't think that after 
three centuries, people would still have that dependency tied to your nations. That's the history. And people still, like Liberians still have family in the U.S. because of transatlantic slave trade. So are many French Africans from, the, uh, from West Africa that are very much tied to France and, and, and other French uh, colonial uh, 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 states in Europe. So it's impossible for you to now start dealing with this humongous amount of uh, inequality and injustice by just giving money to the AU and thinking that you can externalize your border, and that's what they're doing. So they place their borders like in Morocco and in Libya and in uh, Mali and say, let them stop there. We don't want them to show up in our, on our borders, at our ports, and declare that they are refugees. But meanwhile, that's what the United Nations, uh, the, the UNHCR 1951 Convention say. If somebody is forced to leave their home for whatever reason, or for part, uh, based on the five nexus for persecution, that is your nationality, your uh, three nationality, uh, member to a, if you belong to a, a, a particular political group, your religion, and um, if you, uh, um, I forget the last two because it's just skipping off my mind, but those five nexus, uh, if you, you are asking for a refugee status and show up at a border and say, I am a refugee and I left because I was prosecuted, uh, Countries that have signed and agreed to the United Nations 1951 Convention should say, welcome, come on in, we we'll assess you and, and, and show that and have, uh, 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 have you tell us why you think you're a refugee. And if we assess you and, you find, and we find that you belong to this group, we will admit you and provide the assistances that we need to provide to you. But now... Most European countries, Australia, and even Canada is also doing that on international waters, intercepting citizens, intercepting uh, migrants, intercepting people that are in dire need of protection and saying, you don't come here. We'll put up our border at the, you know, the, the U.S., or oh, sorry, the uh, uh, Malian airport and you will be processed there before you even come. So you can even declare, because you're, you can be a refugee in your own country. You have to cross the international border. So if they are not going to leave Mali or Uganda or Sudan, then they can never, ever claim refugee status. Meanwhile, you've your um, colonization era that has seeped into what you now call globalization and neoliberal uh, society with a big tech and uh, technology taking over the world from mostly the U.S. and other European Western countries, it's impossible for people to survive with the amount of inequality that is being handed down to them as, as the result of these uh, global powers that are and geopolitical powers that are playing out there. So now when people try to seek something to make sure that it can sustain their lives because as human beings that's what we do we, we we try to make sure we are surviving and preserve our lives and then you just cut them out and literally leave them to die so um that was what i focus on on this chapter and on that note i just want to say once again thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share my passion and my frustration uh, on this topic. Uh, it's something that I spent uh, most of my life doing, living it every day. And so I am always honored and opportune and feel grateful to be able to share my story and my experience. Thank you. I'm done, Joanna. Thank you, everybody. I wonder that, should I give, a, um, Joanna, um, if it's still okay, should I give a a quick reflection as we schedule, but well, should we rather go into the Q&A immediately? I would like your reflection if that's okay, please. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll be brief so that we keep enough time for Q&A. Um, first of all, um, thank you, um, Veronica, for your uh, very rich presentation. Um, I have a, you know, this is a hard copy, which I read. 
a few times already. Um, I think uh, about the book, I think it's extremely, not just important, but also timely. And uh, there, one of the major reasons why I really like this book is that thematically, it's covering quite uh, diverse, important, and interconnected issues. For example, you mentioned today about the climate changes, you know, conflict-inducing um, displacement, even disaster, LGBT, you know, human trafficking. Um, there are not many books which basically cover these thematic different themes in one book. And also, geographically, it is very, very diverse. Um, and I think uh, you really took the capitalize on the import, um, strength of this edited volume to bring in, you know, like a different experts, because the book is covering Africa, Australia, and Mexico, and also Bangladesh. Okay, and uh, that gives a lot of uh, implications for really wider audiences. And uh, the reason I think this combination of thematically rich and also geographically diverse is important is that we tend to use the word, you know, kind of mixed migration in a recently quite inadvertent way. It sounds like it's telling something, but often the problem is that it kind of dehumanizes, dehistoricizes people's reason to move. And uh, I think in your book, you really challenge that. You try to contextualize, historicize, and humanize why people move, you know, under what conditions. And I think your book really tells this story very rich. And uh, one last point I, I will say, and I will just after this one shut up, is that um, your critical approach, which you have been employing for a really long time, um, your critics is you know, even AU, EU um, policy responses, which is of course has an implication about this externalization politics uh, employed by global nodes. But often, sometimes global south, in some cases, taking advantage, which is very visible if we look at the current Turkey, you know, EU arrangement, etc. So, I I don't really I cannot summarize your book because in a way it is very interdisciplinary and the rich and also diverse and the inclusion of these different authors is not an easy job. So I think. Uh, you and Professor Bender really did a great job to put them together. And it was, I believe it was a massively challenging task, but I think you did it. So um, yeah, that's very recommendable. And also when we think about, you know, other forced migrations happening recently, including Ukraine case and Rohingya, and unfortunately probably Afghan case as well. Um, I think a lot of themes in your book will resonate with this ongoing post-migration. So thank you and also congratulations. Yeah. Joanna, that's it from my side. Okay, awesome. So I think Davina said that they have to leave, um, but I think there's a question in there. If you want to start with that one, we can also, you can also unmute yourself and ask questions. Maybe just put up your hand if you've got a question. Joanna, will you be able to read Davina's question? Because it's a little bit, and it might take, you know, some silence to read it, if that's okay with you. For sure, that makes sense. Um, okay, I think I'm going to read the whole thing. Um, so, rich interdisciplinary and global networks. Thank you for sharing. The language of self-reliance in the UNHCR has also paved the way for a capitalist solution to refugee crisis which necessitates the protracted refugee settlements, for instance, in the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya. It is reported that corporations like Google, Microsoft, Amazon use systems of microwork contracts for refugees who are essentially a captive labor market. I'm wondering if this is extensive through the camps in Ghana that you're familiar with. Yeah, um, should I just uh, 
this moment go one, one by one yes and i'm also catching up the the text yes um uh, thank you this is uh, um from dr devina ba banda am i pronouncing her name probably uh, correctly um this is a really important and also uh critical question um just to directly answer in the in response to this question is that in the case of uh, um, Budiburam refugee camp uh, where I worked, where I worked in Ghana, um, this level of like a private sector engagement um, at this level, like for example, like a Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, um, these companies are not necessarily those big players were not necessarily present. And uh, I mean. Uh, Veronica, you can, you know, probably you have more recent insights, but when I was doing the study, um, these uh, major companies were not there yet. But um, I also work in East Africa. Um, I have never been in that up, but recently in Kenya, Uganda, um, some of the major uh, companies are entering these camps and they're considering refugees as a kind of uh, customers, buyers, consumers. And uh, this trend actually have been happening in many refugee camps uh, I worked. I can name just the, um, some of them. So this, I saw this kind of uh, in some cases using like refugees in the camp as a kind of a labor and often um unfortunately like a cheap labor this kind of modality has been observed yes certainly in the dub but a few other places so i think under the name of self-reliance this kind of modality and uh, also private sector involvement is gradually kind of justified um I'm not de definitely agreeing with this kind of view, but often used as a kind of a, um, how do you say, almost like a strategy by UNHCR, you know, with this positive notion of self reliance Sometimes they use the word economic inclusion and also private sector involvement. All of these things sound very positive, um, at least on the surface, but actually, as you rightly pointed out, sometimes it is a different form of this kind of cheap labor, captive labor. And this is definitely the possible risk behind these positive um, concepts. Um, I don't know, Veronica, how you think about this issue, but probably you also have some insights, I believe, yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're right, uh, Neo. It's still the same relatively when you left. The camp has actually really downsized. Uh, I mean, uh, it's called settlement. Legally, it's not. It's no longer a refugee camp, as you know. It's a settlement, so it's really downsized. Um, and Google is in Ghana, so that's for sure. But they're making use of Ghanaian cheap labor as opposed to refugees on the camp. What you have to understand with uh, Davina's question is the fact that Liberians are, we're never really given the opportunity to access education. And this is my problem with that so-called durable solution. People live in protracted situations for three decades and still have never had, you know, decent education. And that was one of my reasons for also leaving the camp because I knew that a camp school would never allow you to get, you know, past your O levels to go and continue with your A levels and get to university like I was fortunate to do when I was a refugee in Ghana. So if they don't have those basic education, they can't be they can't be that kind of cheap labor for high tech. But I know certainly in Dadaab and Kakuma in Kenya and and uh, East Africa, that is happening there. I know you're you know you're uh, doing some work in Kenya and you also have an upper hand to speak to that. But I know uh, I've connected with folks there and 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 I know that they've been recruiting refugees because Dadaab is and 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 uh, Kakuma is little, is larger than what we have in Ghana. And they seem to have a lot more educational uh, skills compared to Liberian refugees. So it's easy for big tech to use them. But before 
uh, I said I closed uh, I closed my mouth. Uh, I just wanted to highlight Neil's paper. So Neil Baloda wrote a paper about doing research with refugees. So big tech is one thing, but universities, institutions are also a big exploiter of vulnerable populations. We know that through our history from Tuskegee Dreyer to the uh, research in South Africa, I mean, we know that to Nazi Germany, uh, eugenics project, we know that. So like, we have to also remember it's not just big tech. Big tech when we give ethics um, approval for our institutions to go down to poor refugee camps to collect data, we have to also understand that that is a big expectation uh, environment and, and vulnerability of refugees and migrants that are in those situations. So thank you, uh, Tafina. I know she's gone, but. We got it recorded, though. Um, so I think next we have Mike up for a question. And Mike, did you want to use your mic? Sure. <laughs> Veronica. We had such a great chat about um, Jollof rice. You know, I, I don't want to make light of um, some really heavy topics, but, you know, we got to talk a little bit about uh, your mistaken idea that maybe Liberian or Ghanaian Jollof rice is better than Nigerian. So that's okay, though. We'll, we'll let our different opinions exist. Um, but I guess more in terms of what are you aware of for how the effects of populations that are forced into other spaces and then over that length of time decades you know that will surely have an impact on the way um you know the foods like the different exposures among peoples and certainly like there will be times that you you just make do with whatever material is available but uh what's your observations there with with because food has to be every day like you can't get away from that and I'm just um, interested to hear what you have to say about that. You want to go first, Neo? It's okay, because I think you had a good time when you were on the camp. <laughs> no, no, go, go ahead. It was really meant for you as well. And oh. I think you can speak. <laughs> I think you can really speak more um, empirically, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Neo. No, that's a good question, Mike, and it's so nice to see. So Mike and I have been exchanging by email forever since I've been hired by Antabasca, and we've never met. <laughs> this is our first meeting. <laughs> so nice to see you, Mike, and I really look forward to coming up there one of these days to get to meet you physically. Oh, but that's a brilliant question. I think what Neo presentation does when you look on the cover of his book, you see that the... Um, People on the camera are selling and doing, you know, small micro businesses. What Liberians did in terms of food, because Ghanaian dish is very different from Liberian dish. And, you know, we cook the best jello rice, of course. Um, but to start growing in Ghana, because, you know, as a child, your uh, taste buds are introduced into certain tastes and you get used to it. It's hard to really change it. You can eat other food, but... It's just really hard, and Ghanaian food is not anything close to Liberian food. So Liberians started to grow, and when you go back to the camp now, you see that they're still growing. The gardens and the, and the little farms are still thriving, and that's what they do to sell Liberian-grown vegetables. We eat a lot of vegetables and leaves in Liberia, and they can say that, I mean, from the dobagi to the potato grains, to the cassava leaves, to the cabbage and the beans, like we eat so many, and West Africa is so diverse with uh, vegetation. We have the most diverse vegetation in, in, on the continent. And so Liberians started to grow uh, in Ghana. And that's where, you know, when I was in school and I didn't have, I wasn't living on a camp, my mom, for, for the time my mom was there, she will, you know, cook and bring it to me to school. And um, and now, even as a migrant in Canada, um, there is one, there's, there are two African stores that we call Kaswa. So, Neo, there's Kaswa here. You know Kaswa? You remember Kaswa, Neo? Yes. So, somebody opened a store here and they call it Kaswa. There are two Kaswa stores in Edmonton. And that's where I go to get my fix because I don't have Canadian taste. I don't eat fries and ketchup. Like, 
burger. I don't eat meat. So I do go to Kaswa regularly to uh, buy um, West African food. They don't really sell Liberian food, but now I've learned to eat Nigerian and Ghanaian and Cameroonian because you would never almost see any Liberian restaurants or Liberian markets in Canada. Forget it. Good luck. <laughs> So, yeah, that's a really good question. It really uh, affects our health. You know, like I'm not introduced. I wasn't introduced to a lot of the food that I eat now. And that affects my health, my breathing, you know, because it's just different diet. The same thing, sugar and 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 all kinds of processed food did to Aboriginal people and make them overweight in Canada. It's the same concept. You know, I, I wasn't didn't grow up around that kind of diet. But now. You know, I have to survive. Like you said, I have to eat. So, and I just make do. I try to replace spinach for potato greens. You know, they belong to the same family. So I cook spinach leaves like potato greens. <laughs> you know, so thank you. Thank you. And really good to see you. We'll see you sometime yes. up here soon, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and I think we've got Jane next. Yeah, I just wanted to let Mike know that uh, Liberian jollof rice cooked by Veronica is very good. And uh, don't leave home without it, Veronica, because you're going to get asked about it when you do meet Mike in person. I have a question for Nao. Um, Veronica told us quite a bit of the backstory about how she um, uh, came to her area of study, that it's her lived experience. And she, she expressed amazement that you had chosen Liberia as your area of study, um, your uh, case study for your PhD. So could you give us some background on why you chose Liberia and, and, and what sort of a reflection on how it has informed your scholarship subsequently? Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, uh, yes. Um, yeah, this is a question I have been uh, asked uh, almost always, and uh, today I kind of skipped a little bit of background. But um, myself, um, you know, to be very honest, it was a bit of a uh, coincidence, and uh, um, it's also a little bit related to my career pathway. At the beginning, um, I think Joanna briefly explained my kind of personal background. Before I entered academia, I mean, before I started my PhD, um, I was working as a you know, aid practitioner um, for UN system and for NGOs. And uh, the reason I came uh, very close to Liberian refugees and especially in Ghana's context. Um, very initially, I was uh, working for UNDP, United Nations Development Program, and my first uh, um, assigned country was uh, Ghana. And uh, I was also taking uh, short trips to um, like Liberia and also a little bit Sierra Leone. And uh, so I have become very, very familiar with the kind of regional dynamics and also at that point, refugee issue in West Africa was very, still very huge. And uh, so, but more concretely, I started working inside this camp um, as a volunteer uh, for NGO working for child soldiers, especially. And uh, this is an organization that my colleague uh, uh, of the UNDP initially founded and I was uh, deeply involved in this organization. So I started uh, going to the refugee camp almost every weekend and uh, I that's the time I became very very close to these uh, Liberian refugee families and uh, also I was struck with the you know as I mentioned this uh, at a quick glance, it looks a very active economic hub, and it doesn't really look like a refugee camp, which I had a very stereotyped image. So 
in many ways I was so attracted by you know this refugee uh, camp and the population and also their dynamism and also personally I think I really more like a genuinely enjoyed working with them through this uh, organization and uh, so I think in a way these Liberian <laughs> refugee people are the ones who kind of uh, told to me um, what is it, it is like to live as a refugee and it's a mixture it's always a positive side their resilience and also their um, determination all of these positive side but it's not just that one there was also certainly challenges and also as I mentioned impoverishment poverty and also some of the people I worked with these uh, um, very difficult background including as a kind of a child soldier so for me they are the kind of a people who induce me to go into deeper to understand this kind of forced migration more deeply so during that period I kind of decided okay I would like to consider this is a kind of my future profession and if I'm going to this uh, area then Liberian refugees are the one definitely I want to go more like a deeply and more personally. So that's the kind of my background. Um, yeah, and this is how I started to going very deeply with this operation. And uh, as uh, Veronica mentioned, in my country, um, uh, also maybe another reason is that in my country, Africa, especially West Africa, Particularly if you go to like a Sierra Leone, Liberia, in a way, these are the places there are very few um, people who pay attention. So I wanted to rather go into the countries where a lot of Japanese have very limited knowledge. And uh, because I thought that this is also more useful when I think about the kind of dissemination of the research in the future, especially in my own country's context, in this case, Japan. So these combinations are the kind of uh, drives behind me. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, and it looks like no more questions and we're just running up to the end of our time. So that went very smoothly. We got exactly the right amount of time spent. Um, so thanks so much to both of you for, for coming and um, coming up with the idea and giving us the books. Um, this was really great and super interesting, and I'm excited to be able to share the recording as well. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Neil, yeah. with chats on. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Joanna, and uh, everyone. Um, I still, just for the information, I still have a few free copies um, of the book. This is a publisher sent to me. So um, if you're interested in, um, I'm happy to send, uh, it might take a bit of time, but I'm happy to send it to some of the participants today. So um, let uh, me know or let Joanna or Veronica know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We just wait till everybody goes, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> yeah. This is so nice. Thank you.